Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm going to talk about today is the uh, question, is carbon dioxide a pollutant or a benefit? And listening to Jay's talk, you now know what answer I must come up with. But in any event, um, we've all heard that carbon dioxide, of course, is a pollutant. It drives climate. It is the single most important factor that determines what the climate's going to be uh, in the future and what the temperature is going to be and how much precipitation there's going to be, so much so that we have to put a danger sign on carbon dioxide. Um, but the question I really want to ask is, is it really a benefit? Not just simply um, has it gotten a bad rap, but is it really something that we could do with a little bit more? Here's a carbon dioxide concentration at Mauna Loa Observatory. Uh, you can see it sawtooths up. You can see the seasonal cycle. It's gone up by about a third since the middle of the last century, and most of that's due to human activity. But let me start you with a quote. This is from Sylvan Whitwer. He's an agronomist who served as director of the Agricultural Experiment Station at um, uh, Michigan State University. He said, it should be considered good fortune that we are living in a world of gradually increasing levels of atmospheric CO2. The rising level of atmospheric CO2 in a universally pre premium, gaining in magnitude with time in which we can all reckon for the foreseeable future. Well, let's look at somebody on the opposite side of the spectrum. This is Ms. Janine Benyus. She's the Rachel Carson Environmental Ethics Award winner. I'll let you think about that for a moment. She said, organisms don't think of CO2 as a poison. Plants and organisms that make shells, coral, think of it as a building block. And indeed, if you think about uh, photosynthesis, we need carbon dioxide, we need water, we need energy, and we put together the sugars that essentially makes life and makes, makes life grow. In fact, greenhouses, professional greenhouses already knew this. And if you go to any high-end commercial greenhouse, you'll find one of these boxes or one by another company. But essentially, it enriches the carbon dioxide inside the greenhouse to two, three, or four times the natural concentration. Why is that? Because they already know what we already know, which is it causes plants to grow faster and improves plant quality. This is a famous shot from uh, Sherwood Itso. Here is ambient CO2. He took a little seedling, grew it in 350 parts per million. Uh, by a certain time, it had grown to the size of about up to his belt buckle. Uh, one growing at 500 parts per million had grown up to sort of the middle of his chest. One growing in 650 parts per million had grown to about the top of his uh, neck. And one growing at about uh, 800 parts per million are essentially grown to about the size of him. So more carbon dioxide provides more building blocks, and we know that plants, therefore, tend to grow more. Here, same thing happens with peas. Here's 97 parts per million, 127 parts per million with pea plants, and if you grow them in increased carbon dioxide concentrations, you can see that the pea plant grows faster and you get more, more pea growth. Uh, um, I think this is, I'm um, not sure what it is off the top of my head. Uh, any event, it's another plant. Sorry, I'm not an uh, agriculturalist. Um, it's dropped my name. Any event, uh, 461, 781, 1218, alfalfa, thank you, essentially is more, more of it you get. So we go to the climatologists, and the climatologists from the second U.S. National Assessment tells us for corn and soybean temperature response, they give us this little outlet block. And if we look at it closely, you can see, wait, I lost the advance. There we go. You can see that it says for corn. Corn will fail to reproduce at temperatures above 93, 95 Fahrenheit, and in particular, the optimum temperature of corn growth occurs at about 81 Fahrenheit. You can see we're not going to get corn growing over much of the United States, and particularly not in the summertime because a large portion of the United States go above 95 Fahrenheit. The concern, of course, is as temperatures rise, this is going to get worse and worse, and the same holds for soybeans. Now, I was talking to a gentleman who's sitting down in the front row, and he said, essentially, but we're growing uh, corn in Phoenix. And I said, you can't be growing corn in Phoenix. It's way too hot for corn. As you can see here, the climatologists tell us corn will fail to grow at temperatures above 95 Fahrenheit. And I know enough about Phoenix. It gets above 95 Fahrenheit. And he said, yeah, it does, but we still grow corn. So I said, well, how can that be? So we went to Iowa State, uh, Iowa State University's agronomy department course number four, 541, I think it's a graduate level course, and found the following. 
which says, the ideal temperature for crop growth, this being corn, if everything else is satisfactory, such as nutrition and water availability, is somewhere around 93 Fahrenheit. Common corn varieties will grow, not grow between, below 49 and will grow fastest at 93 Fahrenheit. And you look at the curve, you can see it's fairly flat, which means we would expect corn to be growing somewhere between Colorado and Delaware and somewhere between Texas and North Dakota. Indeed, it does. Um, so the question is, why are we being told something different? The interesting thing is there are two other issues that carbon dioxide brings to the table. First issue is that if you look at the idea that more carbon dioxide means plants will be more water efficient. In this case, you can see well watered conditions, you can see water stress conditions, but in both conditions, more carbon dioxide means you use less water. The idea is you have stomates on the underside of plants, they open up to allow gaseous exchange. If you open them up to allow more carbon dioxide in, you open them up wider to allow more water vapor to escape. So if the carbon dioxide concentration is higher, they don't need to lose as much water and they become much more water efficient. Here's an article that came out last year, rising carbon dioxide is making the world's plants more water wise. And the quote for them is, global change is causing the world's plants to grow in a more water efficient way because land plants are absorbing 17% more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than just 30 years ago. We also know the second thing happens. That is, as more carbon dioxide goes in the atmosphere, the actual optimum growing temperature shifts to a higher temperature. Here you can see with 325 parts per million CO2 versus 1935 parts per million CO2, the temperature shifts to an optimum temperature that's warmer. The growth is greater at all temperature ranges, but you can see the optimum growing temperature shifts to a warmer temperature range. So more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere brings about a warmer planet, but also the plants are designed in such a way that warmer planets, uh, more carbon dioxide also gives you much more growth. So we conclude, therefore, that the net effect of elevated CO2 is twofold. One is that it uses less water, and two, that it produces more food. What you would expect it, therefore, that this would be a greener planet. And if we look at the conditions here based on change in leaf area from 1982 to 2015, indeed you can see the greens are associated with greening, uh, the reds are associated with less greening. There are places where there are red, much of that is urbanization effects uh, and so forth, but if you look at most of the planet, you can see that most of the grasses, most of the large areas of forest and so forth have become greener over that last uh, 35, 40 years. Long-lived trees are also growing faster. These are the bristlecone pines, uh, lumber pines, tall, fo foxtail pines that live to be 1,000, 2,000 years old. You can see that generally their rate of growth has increased as the carbon dioxide has increased in the late, 2000, to late 20th century. I'll give you a quote from President Jimmy Carter. He said, the path to global peace is to raise the standard of living of millions of rural people who live in poverty by increasing agricultural productivity. A thriving agriculture is the engine that fuels broader economic growth and development. And indeed, if we go back to Sylvan Whitworth, the quote is, the rising level of atmospheric CO2 could be simply that one global natural resource that is progressively increasing food production and total biological output, both developing and developed countries are and will be sharing equally. In this case, a rising tide will float both boats, developed nations of the world and developing nations. And this is important because much of the planet involves a lot of poor people that need food to exist. Getting food, keeping food, uh, getting refrigeration, thing like that is very difficult. But if we're able to produce more plants due to increased carbon dioxide, that is a good thing, particularly for them. But remember, most of the ocean, or remember most of the land surface, or the, the Earth's surface, is ocean. And as a result, one of the concerns that Jane Lubchenco brought up was the fact that carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean, producing carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, therefore, lowers the pH, and that potentially brings about what she called osteoporosis of the sea. The hard parts of familiar animals are made of calcium carbonate, which will dissolve. 
And so she shows pictures like this where you have shells dying under low pH conditions. Only over a period of about 45 days, they've gone essentially from hard shells to effectively goo. So I looked at a couple other uh, areas. And this is research by uh, Justin Reese from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Here is uh, a Louisiana crayfish, crawfish, sorry, uh, at 400 parts per million. And if we grow one at 2,800 parts per million, they get bigger and more delicious. <laughs> Blue crabs at 400 parts per million. Instead of having the shells disappear, they also get bigger and more delicious. So where does this difference come from? In fact, if we go back to Science Magazine, here's an article by Alasius Rodriguez and, and colleagues in 2008. They concluded that increased atmospheric CO2 also enhances marine life in contradiction to these previous claims where lower pH in the ocean was said to be dissolving calcium carbonate. In particular, she went on to note that what, one, what people were doing was changing the pH by adding hydrochloric acid. You add more acid, you lower the pH, and essentially the, carbonic, the, the, the calcium carbonate was dissolving. The problem is that's not what's happening in the real world. We're producing not more, hydro, not more hydrochloric acid, but more carbonic acid. And as a result, the chemistry for carbonic acid is different for hydrochloric acid. And when you do it the correct way by bubbling in carbon dioxide and producing more carbonic acid, essentially things don't go horribly wrong, but instead the plants and animals grow more. Particularly the growth of phytoplankton, which in the oceans is the, the initial building block, the small plants that start everything in the food chain. We get more of them and we get bigger plants and so forth. Now, I gave this talk previously, uh, and what happened was one of the uh, media apparently took this a little out of context. They said that I was going to say that we were being overrun by uh, deadly crabs, I believe. Uh, apparently, also, the water in the oceans is going to get warm, so the crabs not only would grow bigger, but they would come pre-cooked. Um, I, don't, I don't think people, some of these people have actually seen crabs, uh, blue crabs in the wild. But they said, I was cherry picking. All right, so let's look at sweet cherry. Does sweet cherry respond to carbon dioxide positively? Is it more water efficient? Does it grow better under increased carbon dioxide? The answer is yes. How about, oops, wrong direction. How about uh, silver birch, another tree? The answer is yes. How about yellow poplar? The answer is yes. Well, let's get off trees and go to grasses. How about grasslands in general? The answer is yes. We can look at green algae, and the answer again is yes. We can look at purple sea urchins. We can look at desert lizards, and they grow and do better. And in particular, if we go back, we've seen corn, we've seen soybeans, but if we start to look at some of the more important crops that produce food for people, we see wheat, the answer is yes. We see rice. The answer is yes. We see tomato. The answer is yes. And we see cowpea. And the answer is, of course, yes. I'm sorry. Cowpea. Yes. And the answer is yes. Now, thank you. Don't encourage me, please. If we, go, if we go on, I mean, I, I could be here all day, but lunch is coming up, and you also want to hear two other distinguished people talk. Um, go to co2science.org, which is put together by Craig and Sherwood Itso. Uh, you literally can go to page after page where they keep a record of how different plants. Um, you can see bamboo. I can see in their beets, so forth. I, like I said, I won't go through all of them, of course, but how they respond to changes in carbon dioxide concentrations and how essentially they become much more water efficient and grow better as carbon dioxide concentrations go up. So the answer to my question, is carbon dioxide a pollutant or a benefit? It clearly isn't a pollutant. It is definitely a benefit, and we can do with a little bit more of it. Thank you very much.